Uh, our next speaker, speaker is John Ioannidis. He is the C.F. Renborg Professor in Disease Prevention and Professor of Health Research and Policy, also of Statistics and Biomedical Data Science, the co-director of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford. He is the recipient of so many awards and so many honors that I cannot even begin to, to list them here, but if you look at the bio uh, in the presence materials online, you'll see them. His paper on why most published research findings are false has been the most accessed article in the history of Public Library of Science with more than 2.5 million hits to date and has generated new directions for assessing scientific efficiency, reliability, and reproducibility. He is among the 10 scientists with the highest current citation rate in the world. Uh, which is currently about 3,000 new citations each month. Um, and he has pioneered the field of meta-research using sophisticated methods to study science itself and the way research practices can be optimized to make scientific investigation more rigorous, more efficient, diminishing biases, and promoting integrity. So you're in for a treat. John? Thank you for this very kind invitation. So reproducibility is a term that uh, we're hearing every day, and uh, people uh, are using that term across all fields of science. Uh, these are some data here from the 22 major fields of science and how often they mention reproducibility in different papers. It's an exponential growth. But everyone is using the term in a different way. Um, so there's different types of reproducibility. There's reproducibility of methods, there's reproducibility of results, and there's reproducibility of inferences. And methods means that I can find the script, the code, the software, the data, and understand what has been done, trying to generate some information, some intelligence, some scientific results. Reproducibility of results means that someone else uh, or perhaps the same team or a mixture of the same team and other people are trying to do a similar study and they find the same results. And reproducibility of inferences means that I have a body of evidence, some data, and I look at them and several people look at them and they make the same conclusions. Oh, based on that, you need to treat or you, you shouldn't treat or you should do something or just do nothing. There's reproducibility wars that are ongoing. And uh, many of us are involved in these wars, both at the micro level and the macro level. If you tell someone your study is wrong, I mean, what the reaction is going to be? Uh, he's going to hate you, uh, probably, to start with. And perhaps, perhaps, at some point, may start thinking about, well, could that be so? If you tell someone a million papers are wrong, that's not a big deal. Uh, a million papers, not my paper, that's, that's no problem. So there's different levels of wars and battles fought around reproducibility. And the starting point is that we just have too much information out there. We have too much significant information that people claim it's novel, it's interesting, it's potentially actionable. Uh, a couple of years ago, we looked across the entire biomedical literature uh, since uh, 1995. And whenever there was a p-value in the abstract, 96% of the time, the results were statistically significant. And almost always, the authors would say that that's also conceptually significant and there's something to do about it. Clearly, we cannot act on tens of millions of fronts. I mean, if you tell a patient there's, there's tens of millions of things that you should do with your life, you know, he's going to step back and run away. Information and intelligence needs to be classified in these broad categories. First of all, any information and any intelligence. That sounds good, but what exactly is going on behind that? One possibility is that we have inaccurate false information and intelligence. Or we could have accurate but useless information and intelligence. Or we could have false but seemingly useful information and intelligence, or hopefully accurate and useful information and intelligence. Unfortunately, the last scenario is not as common as we would wish. The main issue is that unless information and intelligence is both accurate and useful, it can create major problems. 
these problems are likely actually to affect differentially people with different access to such information. And this means that those who have access to and using more information and intelligence may end up being at a disadvantage. So usually we think that the poor and the disadvantaged and minorities and people who don't have access to information will be a disadvantage. I think it's equally likely or even more likely that people who are wealthy, well off, uh, they have access to more information may find themselves in real trouble more often. A couple of months ago, we published that paper in the BMJ where we summarized all the evidence on incidentalomas from imaging studies. Incidentalomas means that you have done some imaging tests like a CAT scan or an MRI that you really didn't have a reason to do it. I mean, you had no symptoms, for example, but now here comes some finding. And it's an incidental finding, an incidentaloma. What are you going to do with that? Well, maybe you're lucky. Maybe you picked up a cancer that was uh, not noticeable, and you act early, and you save your life. But maybe you picked something that you should never have picked up. And these incidentalomas, as you see in this fine print in the table, are very common. Sometimes in some tests, like MRI, they can occur in 20 30% of the imaging test. For example, a person who was close to my family in Europe, very wealthy, very well informed, well educated, had a CAT scan for no good reason. You know, just let's have an extra CAT scan, you know, no big problem. Found a mass in the pancreas. A surgeon was consulted, had an operation to remove the mass. The mass was found to be benign. So it was something that would never have caused problem. But that person had post-op complications, sepsis with acinetobacter, ended up in the intensive care unit, had barrow trauma while being intubated, died. 50 year old. Hmm? So in the current era, with a geometric exponential growth of information, we will have a geometric exponential growth of incidentalomas. And the question is, what do we do with them? Much of the information that would help us sort out which of these incidentalomas we should just forget and which ones we should act comes from our ability to study what these granular piece of information mean, which ones are actionable and which are not. Most fields, unfortunately, do not have enough information to allow us separate what is useful and actionable from what is not. Fields that have some of the best scientists in the world and some of the most prolific literatures like neuroscience, a few years ago when we looked across the evidence from early basic research all the way to clinical trials, we found that commonly they lack evidence. They have what we call power failure. They have very small studies that are likely to have very high rates of both false positives and false negatives. The pipeline for predictive and precision medicine most of the time is unfortunately, a pipeline. It's a leaking pipeline. We start from thousands and millions of people producing papers, making quote unquote discoveries. Then gradually, a few of them we try to validate. Well, then we try to translate a few of them and evaluate and hopefully reach implementation. The loss is tremendous in the process uh, because our studies and our resources are not such that would allow us very high efficiency. I would argue that we need to go the opposite way. We need to start from what do we really need? What do the patients need? What is it that they are lacking that we need to find for them? Rather than blast them with information that they will do nothing or you know, they will do only wrong things with it, ask really what are we missing to make things work? So start from the application, the need for the application, and then go back and see, so what exactly is it that we need to get in terms of information and intelligence and exactly that, no more than that, because if we get more than that, we are likely to get into trouble. Here are uh, a summary of 81 studies that have used electronic health records uh, with extensive data sets to produce predictive models. So uh, trying to understand whether with combining information from multiple variables that have been co collected in the electronic health records, uh, one could tell a patient what is the likelihood that he or she will develop some disease or some other outcome. The good thing is that the sample sizes that we're dealing nowadays are a million fold compared to the neuroscience studies that I showed you that have the power failure. 
Uh, also, the number of variables that we can explore has gone up exponentially. And we can build models currently that include 10,000 or more variables, which is really fascinating. I mean, if you compare of trying to make prediction in the past based on age, gender, and a couple more predictors, now we have 10, 20, 30, 50,000 variables that we can incorporate. This is great news. The not so good news is that with 10,000 variables in most applications, we're not really doing much better compared to just having two variables. Sometimes we're not doing better even compared to eyeballing the patient, having a physician see the patient, you know, which is becoming a rarity nowadays. Standardization might help. This is a snapshot of 60 studies of risk factor epidemiology on risk factors to de develop pterygium, which is an eye condition. And I have plotted for you with color what are the variables that are being considered in that model that tries to explain the risk of developing that disease. There's not two studies that have used the same definitions. Everybody's doing their own. So we need to somehow find ways to streamline information, standardize information, and, and make sure that we use the same definitions. If we don't do that, we run the risk of getting what I call the Janus phenomenon. Janus was a Greek Roman god. He could see in two opposite directions. And these are clouds of results from the National Household Survey in the US. Um, if you take a look at the uh, further uh, right panel, this is asking the question whether having higher levels of vitamin E in your blood are increasing or decreasing your risk of death. There's about 1 million points in these clouds, which is 1 million ways to analyze the data from that database to ask uh, and answer that question. And you get 1 million models if you have 20 variables that you can either include or not include in the model. Uh, if you get 30 variables, you're in the range of uh, several trillions of possible analysis. So 70% of these models suggest that vitamin E is good for you, and 30% of these analysis suggest that vitamin E is bad for you. So unless we find some ways to standardize and use a common approach, we are running into trouble. We already have a lot of models out there. We have, for example, 363 models to predict cardiovascular disease. And that was just two years ago. I guess probably we are over 400, 450 now. Um, is any of them good enough? Well, some might be better. Which one are we going to use? We will get into the situation where we have thousands of models to choose from. We'll have more and more, bigger and bigger data, big and bigger opportunities, but also big and bigger noise, and also big and bigger no error potential. Many of the measurements that we work might be interchangeable. So if you're asking me to give you advice about nutrition, I would tell you eat moderately, don't eat too much, uh, just make sure you enjoy your food, and I would probably leave it at that, because we have about one million papers trying to study variables that are extremely interconnected. This is a snapshot of 19 nutritional variables out of 2,000 variables that are included in the Singapore Perspective Cohort. All of them are correlated with each other. So if you ask me which one exactly is the bad one and the good one, I'm going to be in a very difficult position to answer that. Most of the research that we do, unfortunately, is not useful. Most of the research that we do is not answering a specific problem. Sometimes it is creating problems that don't exist. It's not trying to put things into perspective, into the right context. It's not offering real information gain, informativity, entropy change. It's not pragmatic. It's not patient-centered. It's not worth the money. It's not feasible. It's not transparent. Some of that is. How can we improve the portion that fits these qualities? How do we really get to individualize information? Based on what we have done so far, we have ways to move in that direction. For example, this is looking at data from about 400 meta-analysis of individual level data. About half of them identified factors that could separate people at different risk of specific outcomes. Not all of them, but about half of them. Most of those, the differences were not major but they could be clinically insightful in about 20% of the case. How do we get that 20% to become 50%, 80%, 90% in terms of identifying variables, information that have clinically useful information content? We need to try to improve the reproducibility of the evidence. And there's many ways to do that. None of them is perfect. And all of them have plenty of potential and plenty of room for improvement. In a survey of a random sample of the biomedical literature at large between 2000 and 2014, we found that 
No paper out of 250 that we sampled shared fully all the data, and only one shared a very detailed full protocol. We repeated that exercise for 2015, 2017. The rate has gone up. Um, it's about 15% for sharing of data. How can we get that to an even higher level of higher transparency? There's also trends in the opposite directions. So some entrepreneurs even think that science and the scientific method are obsolete. A number of years ago, there was a, he a headline in Wired that we have the end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. We have companies and startups that believe that we don't really need scientific transparency. We just need secrecy and stealth research and just disrupt uh, the healthcare system with secret research that is not shared. The classic example is Theranos. And uh, I had written the first uh, a paper about Theranos about a year before uh, John Carreyrou started publishing his series of uh, attacks in the Wall Street Journal. Um, at that time, people thought that, well, it's John Yanidis again, of course, what do you expect? Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think that we have a serious decision to make. How much transparency, how much openness, how much reproducibility do we want to have versus how much stealth research? And I think this is a major issue. I think for methods, at a minimum, we should have full transparency. I, I, I'm sure that all of you have come across papers that you don't understand how exactly they did things. And we have come up with recommendations in science a couple of years ago where we proposed uh, ways to introduce the reproducibility of methods. We can really improve sharing. This is one example where we went up to 46% sharing with very strict editorial policies and with being able to reproduce all the results that were being published. We need to improve validation, not take everything for granted the first time you see a study around. We need to use more randomized trials of testing whether information can make a difference for patients. We may need to improve different aspects of our methods, of our publishing processes and so forth, of uh, how we disseminate research, of how we reward research. And also, we need to probably test what I'm talking you about, because I may be talking nonsense. So we need research on research and research on research on research um, to make sure that uh, we do have the optimal methods to optimize the information and the intelligence content uh, of our metrics. To do that, I think that we need to re-engineer our reward system. If we ask people just to produce more information, we will drown from information. We will drown from papers, from data sets, from databases, from claims, from quote unquote discoveries that just get us nowhere. I think we, that's great, I, I love all of that and I'm probably contributing to lots of the noise myself, but we also need to find ways to reward quality, to reward sharing, to reward uh, translational potential for those who work on translational potential and uh, overall reproducibility of the work. So how do we find ways that uh, hiring, promotion committees, other situations where we need to decide where do we go, like funding, do take into account these additional dimensions. So that's uh, something that we discussed very extensively in a very, very long paper, if you're patient, uh, to read in PLOS Biology a couple of months ago. Do we need evolution or do we need revolution? Um, revolution would be fantastic. Uh, where was my Kalashnikov? I, I, no, okay. Uh, but evolution would be also fine, and science is a continuous evolutionary process. Uh, in a paper that we published less than two years ago, we have this manifesto of reproducible science where we seek to find opportunities to improve the reproducibility of science, of information, that eventually will find its way in shaping the future of our society. There's many, many such opportunities. And there's many, many different stakeholders who could act and who could make a difference in that process. There's scientists, there's the general public, there's journals, there's funders, there's uh, different organizations that may have an interface with the generation of information or with the use of information or with the compensation of information, like insurance companies, for example, in medicine, or healthcare systems or hospitals. All of those need to be aligned. And I think that this is also a major challenge because different stakeholders 
that may have an impact on the reproducibility of research and information have different priorities. Some might be interested in publishing more, so they want publishable research. Others may want to see fundable research. They want to get money because otherwise you know, they will not be able to continue their career. Others may want to see translatable uh, research that uh, does translate into something really useful rather than useless or inaccurate information. And finally, some would want to make profit out of it. And there's nothing wrong with any of these incentives, but they need to be aligned and different stakeholders will have different viewpoints about what is the most important. To conclude, reproducibility and irreproducibility are key determinants of whether the artificial intelligence revolution will be successful or a fiasco. Inequity may indeed be caused, but the direction is not fully predictable. I think that uh, it could be that those who are well off and those who are more wealthy and have more access to information may be actually having a, a worse outcome eventually. We need more accurate and useful information, not just any information. And finally, there's plenty of room to improve research practices to reach that goal. And I will leave you at that, and hopefully we'll have time for questions. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.